specimen level uh, tests. And today I want to, want to talk about one step further. So we have to put additive manufacturing of continuous carbon fiber on the hard level. And to do that, you have to really utilize the, uh, the, the fiber optimization that you can do with laying every bundle of fibers in a certain way. To do that, we have performed preliminary FE analysis. So we have divided our, uh, our 2D model in an outer perimeter, which is just a, a, a plastic. And then we had a, a uni-actually reinforced part and a bi-actually reinforced part. Uh, we get uh, principal strains and we get principal strain directories from finite element analysis. So these are the major uh, principal strains in 2D and minor principal strains in 2D. Uh, if you're interested, some of this has already been uh, published elsewhere. If you look for, for my name uh, or Chetan Sanandaya, you will find that. So, when, when we are finished with our FE analysis and we're happy that we have a solution that we can print with a uh, 3D printer, then we we go to uh, our continuous carbon fiber uh, 3D printer, which is uh, in this case from an isoprint, and they use a uh, continuous fiber that goes through a nozzle and is coated with a thermoplastic material, and then you lay laid up layer-wise, and you can see when you compare that to the FE analysis, it works, or the printing works, uh, pretty well, that it, it follows the trajectories that we've come up with in our uh, FE model in the major principal strain and in the minor principal strain. <coughs> Note that uh, because of the printing uh, boundary conditions, you can't really print the minor principal strain here in the I region. That's also why we avoided it in our uh, FE analysis. So the fiber placement is tailor made for this look, uh, which is loaded in. Tensile testing in our test lab. Sorry, the wrong direction here. And as you can see here, uh, this is the finished structure so post testing, so you can already see the fracture. But I would like to put your eye here on uh, on our test machine. So uh, we put the uh, lug end of our part into uh, a fixed jig where, where a pin uh, pre prevents any uh, displacement, and then we pull with a hydro hydraulic cylinder. We have, uh, unfortunately, because of lack of material, only three specimens. Specimen two and three in our study are made with the standard uh, material and printing parameters of an isoprint, so you end up with a fiber volume fracture of about uh, 27%. And specimen one in our study, we experimented and uh, decreased the layer height and looked for uh, and obtained a higher fiber volume. And then I would like to go a bit, already a bit into the results. And before we go deep into that, uh, just note that we, you can see the spectral pattern. We use the 3D digital image correlation system to measure the uh, surface strains. The first bit that we have uh, validated is in the shaft here, where we assume that we have near uni actual tension here. We evaluated uh, a, a, a surface rectangle and uh, check for the, uh, the stiffness in the shaft region, which gives us results that correspond well with classical laminar theory for the fiber stiffnesses and the fiber volume fraction. So that, that all works well for specimen one with the higher fiber volume fraction, a bit stiffer here, and specimen two and three, lower fiber volume fraction, a bit lower stiffness here. When we go into uh, higher loads, you can see here, unfortunately, the colors don't really match, but this one here is the shaft uh, major principal strain average over this area, and the load in newtons that we have obtained from our testing machine. It's more or less linear until a uh, fracture happens, uh, and then when we looked at two points that are near, or, uh, near the neck and as close to the eye as we can get, unfortunately we couldn't get much much closer because of the restrictions here of the, the chip. But you can get for, for these points also quite linear uh, uh, strain readings over the test. And then when you have these uh, linear relationships, we were tempted to uh, calculate strain concentration factors just to, uh, to see if that helps us then correlate our uh, results with finite element results and maybe get a, a fractures 
uh, stress for uh, the innermost fighters. Right, that will be the straight path to success, but then uh, the strain concentration factors for specimen one over the load, they all looked very nice and went on to a strain concentration factor of three, which we have seen for other specimens before. But then when we reduced or rather used the standard fiber volume fraction for this material, uh, we got a, a rather non-linear behavior here. Um, and we initially couldn't explain that but uh, it gave us not just a nonlinear behavior, but um, if you compare these uh, strengths here, they are significantly lower, much lower than the lower fiber volume fraction would predict. So there, there was a secondary uh, effect in there. So you have, when you reduce your fiber volume fraction and uh, you space your, your layers a bit further apart, you go from a fracture mode that you expect to one that you wouldn't really expect so well. So our theory was in this case that there could be, because we're only measuring the surface strains here, there could be some, um, some uh, breakage of a layer underneath because you have a low price process. We, we don't really know if any subsurface layer is broken. One way where we could uh, kind of get a bit more into detail on, on, on this hypothesis was to look at the bearing uh, stiffness of our, sorry, again, the wrong direction, the bearing stiffness of our uh, look. So when we uh, look at the vertical uh, displacement of, of a point here as low as possible at the mid midsection, we can assume that this gives us um, a representation of the bearing stiffness, so the, the uh, imprint or the, 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 uh, the elastic imprint into the, the look that we get from the pit. Initially, it looks all fairly similar, which is to be expected because it's more of a matrix mode. But then specimen one uh, goes to a higher stiffness, and specimen two and three, the ones you remember with the lower fiber volume fraction, uh, go into a softening behavior. And this softening behavior could potentially be explained by some broken layers underneath there, reducing the area where you have a pressure on your, uh, on your look. So this is the second one of our of our hints that we have. Uh, we went a bit further and looked at the fracture surfaces. So first this is the one with the higher stiffness and you can see for all specimen here the, the fracture happens in the net section which is really nice. Um, if you look at, uh, uh, at, at failure modes in, in laminated, laminated uh, lug eyes, it could as well have been a shear failure here under the uh, under the compressive inload, but they all fail here in the next section, which is good in fiber failure. And I'm afraid you can, you can just about make it all out here on this print, the uh, inside view here. So all the layers fracture within a rather narrow band here for the higher uh, fiber volume fracture. But then for the lower one, we get a bit of a different behavior, and that's where we where we are today, and this is where we still want to go a bit further into explaining this behavior where you potentially have two cracks, one maybe from a subsurface failure that reduced our stiffness, and then a failure uh, that gave us the final failure. Our next steps in this case are to perform a CT scans and find out what was really behind that, and then go into a modeling and see uh, if we find a model that can explain our behavior where we potentially have some, uh, uh, some weaker layers or a uh, slight waviness in there to uh, explain our change in fracture from just the, the standard that we expect to this uh, uh, subsurface fracture that we have experienced in all two specimens, so it's not a singular incident uh, in our analysis. Maybe just for comparison, one other specimen uh, with a different material that we have already CT scanned. You can see this is what fracture should look like. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really see it here so well. And with that, if we summarize what we have seen, uh, firstly, we have from our standard specimens two and three, we get a almost uh, similar 
increase in stiffness in the shaft to the increase in fiber volume fraction. So that's what we expect. Uh, the bearing stiffness is a matrix mode. We get some increase, but that's not so important. But the strength increase is more is quite pronounced, but unfortunately it's not an, a, a benefit of the higher fiber volume fraction, but it's a deficit of the lower fiber volume fraction. So one way of looking at how to remedy that, if we're really looking into uh, a debonding, uh, would be to, to perform post-consolidation or use other composite uh, continuous carbon fiber materials uh, in this application. And then the big next step for additively manufactured continuous carbon fiber uh, parts are then to integrate them in a traditional composite layer or in injection molding uh, processes uh, to be ready for industrial application. But first we have to overcome these limitations uh, and understand especially the fracture behavior that is so different when we just increase the, uh, the fiber volume with the same material with a different layer. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for listening and I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, discussion is over. Nature is open for discussion for questions. Do you have any questions? Don't hesitate, just ask your all polymer experts. Yes, please. Can you maybe comment on the limits of fiber content that can be uh, added to additively manufactured parts? Because I just know from bicycle frames that it's 62 to 68 percent fiber. Maybe. Yeah, that's yes. for, a, for a traditional layup. You wouldn't be able to obtain that with an additively manufactured layup. Um, usually, very quickly go back uh, to the manufacturing, or maybe on this one here. So you can see here there are, uh, there are fiber bundles that are uh, pre-coated. So this is uh, the, the so different uh, uh, so strands of fibers, one and a half K, that are pre-impregnated with uh, 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 thermoplastic material in this case, and then you would have some, they have about 60% fiber volume fraction, but then you have intrinsic little voids and additional matrix material, so you would never get in, in, the, in your additively manufactured part these 60%, so you would aim also for some, some surrounding boundary layers and so on, so you would always end up with somewhat being below 50. So 25 is the standard that the manufacturer uh, uh, when, when, when you do a standard testing or a standard printing and then when, when you reduce the layer height and add some more, uh, some more little tricks and you get a slightly higher one. Okay, one more short question yeah. please, then you consider the know, next one. I know that these, say, ice cream frame making is handcraft basically and uh, do you think that in the near future something sophisticated like a road bike bicycle frame could be made by such a technique? Well, maybe not. Uh, not this, this, so these are really small parts. Um, you would more potentially have an automated fiber placement where you have a, a, a thicker kind of tape of fiber being wound for, for, for tubes and then uh, automatically maybe laid up together. So this is more like for, for smaller structures and a, a very dedicated uh, and then and, and, and tailor made uh, uh, strengthening of, of short reaches. It could well be in a application like a bike frame as well that you strengthen some some part of your frame with this uh, with this method. Thank you very much. <laughs>